air filter, so I don't know what it is. Everything's gonna be okay, baby. Okay, so, how are you? Good. Are you ready for Bible study? Yes. Awesome. What did we study last time? We studied sin and the consequences. Sin and the consequences. Amen. Hey, Mom. Hello, Cindy. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. Hope everybody's doing good. Hope you're doing Miss Krista. Hope you're doing Mama. Hope you're doing good, Cindy. Let's see, talking about grace and law today. Grace is salvation. Law is obedience. Brother Vic is here. Hey, Brother Vic. Good to see you, brother. Good to see you. Going to be talking about grace and the law today. How they are connected. Two sides of the same coin, kind of. And let's see, who's here? Who's here? Who's here? Mom's here. Cindy's here. Krista's here. Brother Vic is here. I say we get started. What do you think? My wife has ears like you wouldn't believe. If she hears something, something's there, I don't know. All right, pretty lady, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you very much for the opportunity to pray. We thank you very much for the opportunity to study the Bible, to get home safely, and to have uh, friends and family that um, love us and we love them. Lord, these are great privileges we have. So as we, as we thank you, our hearts go to um, Jesus and how we need his blood for the cleansing of our sin. So, Heavenly Father, forgive us. Please cleanse us and please bless us with your spirit as we study the word. We ask that you would speak through us, help us to hide behind the cross, and that as you give us your spirit, Lord, you would give it in a double, triple, quadruple portion, and that you would help us to understand grace and the law. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Brother Allen's here, Sister Kathy's here, it's nice to see everybody, nice to see everybody. Okay, so grace and the law, that's a funny topic, um, kind of in the Christian world, grace and the law causes a division in the Christian world, and we want to see what does the Bible have to say about grace and the law? Are they two separate things? Do they make void each other, or are they complementary to each other? Now, I'm going to start with a story that happened to me around the time I was about 17. 17 years old, driving my parents' car without a license, don't have my seatbelt on, speeding down the street. I see the signs. I know the, si I know the speed limit. Maybe I even went through a stop sign. I don't know. All I know is that I get pulled over, and the policeman says to me, do you know why I stopped you? What do I say? I don't have a seatbelt on. I know I'm speeding. I know the speed limit. I've seen the sign. Probably ran through a stop sign too. I'm condemned. I am literally breaking the law. I deserve the punishment that the police officer is about to give me. And the only thing I can do is say, yes, officer, I was speeding. I think I went through that stop sign. I'll admit to you that this is not my car and I don't have a license. All I can say is, will you please have mercy on me? True story. That literally happened. 17 years old. 17, 18 years old. What happens? Officer says, give me uh, your identification. He goes back to the car. He runs my name. And for about five or ten minutes, I just pray. I remember praying like I never prayed before. Officer taps on the window, says, here's your license. I don't want to see you doing anything like this ever again. We're going to pull off. I want you to go straight home. What happens? In my heart, I'm very thankful for the mercy and the forgiveness that this officer of the law has shown me. Grace, mercy, forgiveness. I do exactly what he says. I wait for him to pull off, and then I go home. And from that moment on, literally from that moment on, when I drive down the street, I want to do the right thing. I'm not saying I haven't been pulled over after that, and I'm not saying I haven't been in a rush and 
go 80 down the throughway at times. But that was a changing point in my life where this officer, who clearly could have thrown the book at me, had mercy on me. And that mercy, that grace, did something in my heart where I wanted to do the right thing when I was driving. Right? I didn't get punished for breaking the law because I asked for mercy and I received it. That officer was gracious and merciful to me and he gave me mercy. That's grace. Breaking the law, justly deserving the punishment, receiving mercy and not getting the punishment that you rightfully deserve, that's grace. That's mercy. Forgiveness is grace. It's a gift, something that you can't earn. I broke the law. I deserved a ticket, at least a ticket I deserved. The punishment, but that officer gave me grace. He gave me mercy. And that grace and mercy, that didn't come from the law. That grace and mercy came from the one who oversees the law. It's very important. The law only tells me what's right and wrong. It's the one who oversees the law that says, I will give you grace and mercy or I will not give you grace and mercy. It's the one who oversees the law that has the ability to give me grace and mercy, not the law itself. God's law is the same way. God's law tells me what's right and wrong. If I break God's law, I'm a transgressor. I deserve punishment. But the one who oversees the law, that's God, that's Christ. He can give me mercy if I ask for it. And when, when he gives me mercy, that's grace. The forgiveness is grace. Breaking God's law demands a punishment. That punishment is the second death, the lake of fire. There's no way around it. If I break God's law, that's a sin. For the wages of sin is death, the second death, the lake of fire. Breaking God's law only condemns us. The law of God, it cannot save us because the law of God is incapable of giving grace and mercy. It's only the one who oversees the law is who's able to give us grace and mercy. Someone in charge of the law needs to be the one to give me grace and mercy for the broken law. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Of course, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. Galatians, Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The gift is salvation. The gift is forgiveness. It's the gift of God. It's the grace of God. It's the undeserved present that God gives us when we ask for forgiveness, as we accept Christ as our Lord and Savior. Salvation through faith. I don't have to do anything to deserve it. I don't have to do anything to deserve it. This is grace. The one who oversees the law, having mercy upon me, forgiving me for breaking his law. This is an undeserved gift. I don't do anything to earn it. This is grace. This is salvation through faith. The gift is believing without seeing, and I have nothing to do with it. It's the one who oversees the law, who does this for me. It has nothing to do with me. It's not of works, least any man should boast. This is the gift of God. This is grace. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. That's what I earn when I break God's law. I earn death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But the grace, but the mercy, but the forgiveness of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The gift is faith. This is very important. The gift is mercy. The gift is faith, not works. Because faith is possible for every single human to give God. Right? If salvation was based on works, if salvation was based on something that I did, there would always be a stumbling block to somebody somewhere. What does that mean? Well, if salvation was based on works and you needed to have lots of money to buy salvation, 
then only the rich people would receive salvation and the poor people would be left out to dry. Imagine if salvation was based on traveling somewhere, right? Then only the physically fit who could endure the journey would be saved, right? Imagine if it was feeding the poor. Imagine if it was educating the uneducated, whatever the works is. If works is always the basis of salvation, it's always going to be a stumbling block to, to somebody somewhere. Somewhere, somebody isn't going to be capable of doing the work that causes salvation. This is why it is grace through faith do we receive salvation. It's a gift of God. Simply believing what God says is true and receiving it. Ultimately, when man tries to please God through his own works, that man is saying what something that I do is equal or greater to the sacrifice of Christ. This is why faith is the basis of salvation. Faith is salvation. And that's a gift. That's grace, forgiveness, mercy. Through faith is the gift. Because when we human beings say something that I do causes me to salvation, we're saying that what I have done is of equal value to the sacrifice of Christ. This is why works does not count. And this is why no man can boast because it doesn't matter how much uh, poor people you feed. You'll never be able to do anything that is equivalent to the life of God. You'll never be able to do anything that equals the sacrifice of Christ. No amount of good works, no matter how many poor people you feed, no matter how many people you educate, whatever they are, However close you come to doing the greatest feats that humanity has ever done, it will never equal the sacrifice of Christ. The sacrifice of Christ, the mercy, grace, and forgiveness that he gives us. This is the gift. We receive it by faith, and this is how we obtain salvation. There's nothing I can do to earn that, right? 1 Timothy 2.5 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. There's only one mediator. There's not two mediators. There's not three. Mary does not count Buddha, Vishnu, Krishnu, uh, name any one of the Babylonian deities. They cannot help us. There's one mediator between man and God. That's Jesus Christ. And this is what the Bible says. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 9. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 9. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 9. And being made perfect, talking about Jesus, and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. This is very important because grace is like a coin. Coins are never one-sided. Coins always have two sides. And it says that Jesus, being made perfect, became the author of eternal salvation. That's grace. Unto all them that obey him. Obedience is always connected to the law. So for us to say that grace makes the law void, what we're saying is that the scripture standard of obedience is no longer necessary. Because salvation nullifies obedience. But it's very clear that salvation is directly connected to obedience. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 9. And being made perfect, he, Jesus, became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. The other side of that coin, which is grace, is obedience to Jesus. Salvation is directly linked to obedience. 1 John chapter 2, verse 6. 1 John chapter 2, verse 6 says this. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. He, me, if I say that I abide in him, him is Christ. If I say that I, I abide in Christ, I ought also to walk, even as Christ walked. If Christ was obedient to the 
father and chose rather to die than sin against God, that's the example that was left for me, and that's the example I must strive for. 1 John chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. 1 John chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. If we say that we have fellowship with him, Jesus, if we say that we have fellowship with Jesus and walk in darkness, that's sin, if we say that we have fellowship with Jesus and walk in sin, we lie and do not the truth. If we walk in the light, that's truth. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin. Salvation and obedience are linked. Time and time again, we're going to see in the scripture, two sides of the same coin. Grace is what saves us, no doubt. But on the other side of that coin is obedience. And when we say that we know him and keepeth not his commandments, it proves to God that we are a liar and we do not know him. 1 John chapter 3, verse 6. 1 John 3, 6 says this, Whosoever abideth in him, that's Christ, whosoever abideth in Christ sins not. Whosoever sins hath not seen him, neither known him. This is willful, uh, open, blatant sin. We all make mistakes. We all fall short of the glory of God. But when we openly walk in transgression and think that there is nothing wrong with it, it says this, Whosoever abideth in, in him sins not. But whosoever sins hath not seen him, neither known him. Salvation and obedience, they are directly connected. Jesus showed us that it is possible to obedient to God. Jesus showed us at the cross that it is completely possible to be, be obedient to the Father as we rely on him for strength. And that's where the key of obedience really lies. Not in my own strength. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. I need to rely on God for the strength to be obedient. All right? The grace of God, this is very important, the grace that God gives us, this is the same grace that the officer gave me, right? The officer gave me grace. And what did that do? That put something in my heart, in my mind, that from this moment on, I wanted to be a law-abiding citizen as I'm driving down the street. That's what it did, right? The forgiveness that that officer gave me caused in my heart the desire to obey the law. The same thing. I mean, I'm 40 years old. That happened 23 years later, and I still remember it, and it still affects me. When God forgives me of my sin. I broke God's law, he gave me grace, he gave me mercy, and that forgiveness, that mercy, that grace God gave me, that should put in my heart the desire to obey the law. At least it should. It should do that, right? Because God uh, for so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth, when you look at the cross and see what Jesus went through to obtain my forgiveness and salvation, that should, that should do something in the heart and say, whoa, whoa, whoa. I need to be obedient to this deity who loved me in such a way. Now, we got a question. And that question is, does the officer's forgiveness, right? That officer, he forgave me, right? Does that officer's forgiveness in that one situation allow me now to break the law anytime I want? That's important. Does the forgiveness that the officer gave me in that moment allow me now to break the law whenever I want? And the answer, of course, it's, it's, it's obvious. The answer to that is no. Just because the officer had mercy on me in that moment does not mean I can go around driving like a speed demon, running through stop signs and doing whatever I want. Absolutely not. Let's apply this to the mentality of what the majority of Christians say who say grace nullifies the law. Does God's grace, does God's forgiveness allow me to break his law anytime I want? No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. God's law is perfect, right? God's law is the standard 
It's the foundation of his eternal kingdom throughout all time and history. Those who make it into God's kingdom, the foundation of God's government will always be the law of God. Romans chapter 3, verse 31. Romans chapter 3, verse 31. That's what it says. Romans 3, 31. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid we establish the law. So, as I am saved by grace through faith, that does something with the law, right? That puts the law in its proper place. It establishes how important the law actually is. Because if the law wasn't important, Jesus wouldn't have had to come and die. That's just a fact, right? Through faith, now the law is established as being very, very, very important. Do we make void the law through faith? God forbid. The law is now established in its proper place because it took the Son of God to come and die so that I could be forgiven of his broken law. That's established. That's unmovable. Very important. But there are scriptures that say that the law was nailed to the cross. Colossians chapter 2, verse 14. Colossians chapter 2, verse 14 says this, Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. Very important. This handwriting of ordinances... How can the law both be established and nailed to the cross at the same time? Right? This is very important because this is where the confusion comes in for the majority of the Christian world. Well, they say, well, the, 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 the law is not made void, but the law was nailed to the cross. And so they come to the conclusion that it was the Ten Commandments that was nailed to the cross, and they say we no longer have to abide by the Ten Commandments. Is that true? Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 13 and 14. Deuteronomy 4, 13 and 14. This is what it says. Deuteronomy 4, 13 and 14. And he, this is Moses speaking, and he declared unto you his covenant, that's his law, talking about God, and he, God, declared unto you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform even the Ten Commandments, and he wrote them upon two tables of stone. So we're talking about God. We're literally talking about the Ten Commandments, which were written on stone with what? With the finger of God. It goes on to say in verse 14, And the Lord commanded me, Moses, at that time to teach you statutes and judgments that ye might do them in the land, whether ye go to possess it. So we see, literally, we see here two laws. We see a law of Ten Commandments written in stone that came from God, and then we see a law, statutes and judgments, which come from Moses. It's very important to understand. Two laws, God's law, the Ten Commandments that God wrote with his own finger, Exodus chapter 20. We're not going to go there. We know it. We know it already. The second law is the ceremonial law the statutes, the judgments, which Moses wrote, right? That was the dietary law. That was the health law. That was the ceremonial law. Check this out. There's confusion between the two laws, right? There's a moral law. This is the Ten Commandments. Exodus chapter 20, you can go read them. You probably know them. The moral law compared to the ceremonial law. The ceremonial law was the sacrificial system needed to show us how sin was forgiven until Jesus came. Because the sacrificial system showed us that an innocent lamb who did nothing wrong took the sinner's place. This was a, a, a symbolic, typological example of what would happen with Christ. Christ, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. An innocent victim took our place. That's the ceremonial law. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1. Hebrews chapter 10, 
verse 1. Hebrews 10, 1. For the law, now we're talking about the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never, with those sacrifices, key word sacrifices, which they offered year by year, continually make the comers thereunto perfect. In the scriptures, you see the word law, and you have to put into context what law is it talking about. Is this talking about the ceremonial law, or is this talking about the moral law, the Ten Commandments? You can't just read one scripture and assume that it's talking about any specific law. I can't just read this and assume it's talking about the Ten Commandments because clearly it says that this law was a shadow of good things to come and that it had to do with the sacrifices. The shadow is always uh, the thing that points to the original. right? My shadow always points back to me. This sacrificial system was the shadow of Christ. This was the thing that taught us about Christ. And to understand which law, you have to read the context to say, is this the ceremonial law or is this the Ten Commandment law? After Jesus died on the cross, no one needed to sacrifice uh, animals anymore. So this sacrificial system at the cross was done away with. It was fulfilled. It was not destroyed it was fulfilled because Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice that ends all sacrifices. So what was nailed to the cross? Colossians 2.14. What was nailed to the cross? It was the ceremonial law. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Okay. Colossians 2.14. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Let no man therefore judge you in meat and in drink or respect of a holy day or of the new moon or of the sat Sabbath, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is Christ. We just saw that in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1, that the shadow was the ceremonial law. We just saw that. There's no way you can take this verse, Colossians 2, 14 to 17, and say that this is the Ten Commandments because the Ten Commandments doesn't talk about new moons. The Ten Commandments doesn't talk about eating and drinking. The Ten Commandments talks about the seventh day Sabbath, but don't let that confuse you with the four Sabbaths that were in the ceremonial law. You got to read the context to figure what was done. It is the, the handwriting of ordinances which Moses did that was nailed to the cross. Deuteronomy 31.24. Now we're being thorough on this because we don't want to make this mistake in assuming that this was the ceremonial law nailed to the cross. We want to be 100% sure. Deuteronomy 31, 24. And it came to pass when Moses made an end of writing the words of this law. So I'm going to read that again. And it came to pass when Moses made an end of writing the words of this law in a book until they were finished, that Moses commanded the Levites, which bear the Ark of the Covenant, saying, Take this book of the law and put it in the side of the Ark. Not inside the Ark. But in the side, there's a difference between inside and in the side. Nowadays, we would say on the side, but uh, King James says in the side. So there was a book of the law, which Moses wrote, and there was a table of uh, stone, the Ten Commandments, which the Lord had written. Two different laws, two different people writing, two different circumstances. Very, very, very important. Exodus chapter 20, we know them, the Ten Commandments. This is how established the Ten Commandments are. Psalm 89, 34. How long do the Ten Commandments stand? Psalm 89, 34. How everlasting are the Ten Commandments? 
Psalm 89, 34 says this. My covenant will I not break. We saw earlier that the, the covenant was a synonym for the law. My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that has gone out of my lips. My law will I not break, nor alter the thing that has gone from my lips. God's law is forever. Every single one of the Ten Commandments. We might not like that as individuals, but every single one of the Ten Commandments is important as a foundation of God's eternal kingdom. The ceremonial law, which had to do with the sacrifices, the feast days, and the forgiveness of sin. This, this is what was nailed to the cross. This is why Jesus said this. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Matthew chapter 5, 17. Here we go. Matthew 5, 17. It says this. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For truly I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one title shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Jesus did not come to destroy the Ten Commandments. Jesus came to fulfill both the Ten Commandments and the ceremonial law. Jesus fulfilled the Ten Commandments by dying in righteousness. Jesus died. He never sinned. He fulfilled the law. As the sacrificial Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world, Jesus fulfilled the ceremonial law. Jesus did not come to destroy the law, the Ten Commandments, he did not come to do it. The cross did not do it. The ceremonial law was fulfilled by Jesus. The moral law, which is the standard of the foundation of God's eternal kingdom, was fulfilled in the life of Christ. But there's this idea, it's a very popular Christian teaching, that the Ten Commandments have been done away with at the cross. Very popular, very popular idea that the Ten Commandments have been done away with the cross. This should be very concerning to us as Christians, right? Did Jesus take away my moral accountability to God? Did Jesus give me a free pass to sin whenever I want? That's very important. Did Jesus do this? Can I lie? Can I steal? Can I murder? Can I rape and not be held accountable to God? Can I worship other gods? Can I make idols? No. Can I take the name of the Lord thy God in vain? No. That is still a sin. These things are still sin and they're still wrong. Even after Jesus gives me mercy and grace. It's the same thing with the police officer. After the police officer gave me forgiveness and I go along and continue to speed, that's still breaking the law. That one time of forgiveness does that mean I have a free pass to go around breaking the law whenever I want? God is no less of a uh, law enforcer or someone who oversees the law. Just because I receive mercy and grace from Jesus does not mean I get a free pass to sin. These are sins. They're still wrong. And we should be avoiding them. Right, this idea of the Ten Commandments being done away with. This is not godly. This is satanic. This should cause us Christians to really think about what is the end conclusion of this idea, right? That the Ten Commandments were nailed to the cross. This is not godly. This is satanic. And this should cause concern because what is the conclusion of this, right? Romans chapter 6, verse 14. Romans 6, 14 says this, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law but under grace. This is the, the verse that gets quoted. You are no longer under the law but under grace, right? But let's think about it. If I'm not under the law but under grace, does that mean I can have other gods? No. Does that mean I can make idols? No. Does that mean I can take the Lord's name in vain? No. Does that mean I can steal? No. Imagine going into a church and as the offering plate is being passed by, you take a little out for yourself and say, it's okay, pastor, I'm under grace. I'm not stealing because I'm under 
Come on. It doesn't make proper sense. It's, it's it, illogical when you take this idea that we are no longer obedient to God's commandments because grace forgives us. It doesn't make sense. Can I kill? Can I lie? Can I commit adultery? Can I covet? No. If, if you take this idea of the law being done away with and nailed to the cross, the Ten Commandments, it, it doesn't make sense. It has to mean something else. Romans chapter 6, 15 and 16. What then? Okay, let's go back to 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are whom to ye obey. Whether of sin unto death, or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, ye were once the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. What form of doctrine was delivered? That is the law of God, right? Salvation and obedience go hand in hand. It's true that by grace, by grace, I am saved through faith. And the opposite side of that coin is that I now, because I see my Savior who died for me a tortured death to save me from sin, I now have the desire in my heart to want to do what is good and right in his eyes. Right? Romans chapter 7 verse 12 says this. Romans 7, verse 12. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. The problem is not with the law. The law is holy. The commandment is holy, and just, and good. The, there's nothing wrong with the law. The problem is with me. My nature is flawed. My desire is to do bad. The law is not the problem. I am the problem. And if we go down this, can I lie? Can I steal? Can I go down all of the Ten Commandments? Nine out of ten of them, you will agree with me that it's not okay to do. It's not okay to worship other gods. It's not okay to take God's name in vain. It's not okay to make idols. It's not okay to murder. It's not okay to steal. But the one commandment that the vast majority of the Christian world says that has been nailed to the cross, that is willing to give up, that has been done away with at the cross is the fourth commandment. This seventh day Sabbath, they say that it's the Sabbath that we don't need to obey anymore. This is very important, right? We're going to see how important that ob obedience to all of God's law is. Not just the ones we want, but the ones that even are uncomfortable for us, right? This fourth commandment, the seventh day Sabbath, the majority of the Christian world will say, we don't need to keep the Sabbath anymore. It's been done away with, and it's been nailed to the cross. And that's kind of ironic, because if you read the fourth commandment, it says, remember the seventh day to keep it holy. It's ironic, because the one commandment that gets forgotten, literally the first words that are written in the commandment is, remember the seventh day to keep it holy. So let's look at the Sabbath very quickly and let's look and see how lasting is the Sabbath? Is it eternal? Is it perpetual? Is it something that is going to be throughout the eternal kingdom? This is very important. Matthew 24, 20. Stick with me. Stick with me. Don't go nowhere. You might not be a Sabbatarian, but let me tell you how important the Sabbath is. Matthew 24, 20. Jesus, Matthew 24, is predicting the future. Matthew 24 is a prediction of the future. And as he's predicting the future, he is looking at the destruction of Jerusalem. And this is what he says. 
he says this, And when therefore ye see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, whosoever readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee. Let him which is in the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Let not him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child and to them which give suck in those days. Here it is. But pray that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath. Very important. Very important. Jesus is looking into the future. The destruction of Jerusalem, 70 AD, 40 years after his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. And what does Jesus say? Jesus says that the Sabbath is still in effect. Very important. The Sabbath, in a prophecy by Christ, is still in effect 40 years after his death. Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. Okay, here we go. Hebrews chapter 4. Let's start at verse 3. For we which have believed do enter into rest. As he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the foundation, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he spake in a certain place on the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest from, uh, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works, and in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest. Seeing therefore it remains that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not because of unbelief. Again, he talked. Of, he limited a certain day, saying, In David today, after so long, as it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day. If Jesus changed the Sabbath, because he was the one that needed to do it, because he is the one that created it. Jesus is the creator. Jesus, on the seventh day, made it holy. So Jesus is the one who would have had to change it. The Bible says that if Jesus would have changed the Sabbath, he would have told us. Clearly, Matthew 24, 20 says, Jesus looked down the stream of time, 40 years after his death, burial, and resurrection, and saw the Sabbath still in effect. Jesus didn't change the Sabbath. He was the one that would have had to do it. But many people will say that the Sabbath is for the Jews. Numbers 15, 15. Numbers 15, 15. Here we go. Numbers 15, 15 says this. One ordinance, one law, shall be both for you of the congregation and also for the stranger that sojourns with you. An ordinance forever in your generations, as ye are, so shall the stranger be before the Lord. Anybody who joined into following the deity called Yahweh, doesn't matter if you were born into the congregation or if you were a, a stranger that sojourned with them. There was one ordinance. There was one law. It wasn't two laws, one for the Gentiles, one for the Jews. That's not how it worked. There was one law, one ordinance, both for the congregation and the stranger that sojourneth with them, so that they both may be before the Lord the same. Mark 2, 27 and 28. Jesus, Jesus says the same thing. Mark chapter 2, verses 27 and 28. And he said unto them, The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. Why is Jesus Lord of the Sabbath? Because he created it. right? And Jesus here says that the Sabbath was made for man. Jesus did not say that the Sabbath was made for the Jews. This is not a, a Bible study about the Sabbath. This is a Bible study about uh, grace and the law. But the, the tragic part is that we can all agree that it's wrong to lie, wrong to steal, wrong to kill, wrong to murder, wrong to take God's name in vain. But when it comes to the Sabbath, that's the one commandment 
that is justified in the eyes of the majority of the Christian world as worthy of being broken. It's true, right? Jesus didn't say that the Sabbath was made for the Jew. Jesus said that the, the Sabbath was made for man, indicating all of mankind. The Sabbath is very important, right? He looked into the future. He saw its existence. If Jesus would have changed the Sabbath, he would have told us one law, one ordinance, both for the children of the congregation and the stranger that sojourneth with them. One law before God forever. And Jesus said, the Sabbath is for all mankind. Genesis chapter 2, verse 3. The Sabbath was instituted in creation. Exodus 20, verses 8 through 11. The seventh day Sabbath is literally the fourth commandment. And the Bible says that if we break a commandment, that is sin. Ezekiel 20.12 says that the, uh, that the Sabbath is a sign of allegiance to God. Ezekiel 20, 19 and 20 says that the Sabbath is a sign of sanctification from God. Isaiah 66.23 Isaiah 66, 23. There we go. Isaiah 66, 23. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. Let's talk about the new heavens, the new earth. This is the kingdom of God. And what is being kept in the new heavens and the new earth? The holy Sabbath day. It was instituted at creation. It was reminded to the mankind when given in the Ten, Comm uh, Ten Commandments, right? Commandment number four, remember the seventh day. Uh, Ezekiel says that it's a perpetual sign between you and God and that it is a, 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 a symbol of sanctification between you and God. And it lasts throughout all eternity. There's no way that you can say that the Sabbath doesn't exist. Jesus foresaw its existence down into the future. He prophesied about it. If Jesus would have changed it, he would have told us. Jesus said that Sabbath was for all of mankind because there is one law, there is one ordinance for the children of the congregation and the stranger that is in this world. Very important, right? We already know that Jesus, if he would have changed the Sabbath, he would have told us. But, if Jesus didn't change the Sabbath, and the Sabbath is now changed, who changed it? This, this is it. This is the final Sabbath uh, quote. But if Jesus didn't change the Sabbath, who changed it? Daniel 7.25. Daniel 7.25 says this. And he, that's the little horn power, that's the man of sin, that's the beast of the sea who you call Antichrist. This being, which you call Antichrist, changed the times and laws of God. And he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and to think to change times and laws and they shall be given into his hand until a time, times and the dividing of times. There is only one time in God's law. That is, remember the seventh day to keep it holy. This is referring to the little horn power, the man of sin, the son of perdition, who you call Antichrist. You know I got a quote for you. You know it. Papacy quotes, Daniel 7.25, And he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws. Sunday is founded not on Scripture, but on tradition, and it is distinctly a Catholic institution, as there is no Scripture for the transfer of the day of rest, which we just saw, For as there is no Scripture for the transfer of the day of rest from the last to the first day of the week. Protestants ought to keep their Sabbath on Saturday and thus leave Catholics in full possession of Sunday. Catholic record, September 17, 1893. Sunday is our mark of authority. That's funny that the beast of the sea, 
says that Sunday is our mark of authority. The church is above the Bible, and transference of the Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. Catholic Record, London, Ontario, September 1st, 1923. We observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church in the Council of Laodicea, 3, uh, 336 A.D., transferred the holiness from Saturday to Sunday. The Converts Catechism of Doctrine, page 50. Very important. Jesus didn't change the Sabbath. The Bible says it clear. You, who changed the Sabbath? Papacy changed the Sabbath. Clearly, papacy changed the Sabbath. And this is what the Bible says. James chapter 2, verse 10. My, I know my wife knows this. She got the whole book of James memorized. I hear her over there talking about, oh, I know it. James chapter 2, verse 10. Hebrews and then James. I'm almost there. James, I'm right there. James chapter 2, verse 10. James chapter 2, verse 10. For whosoever shall keep the whole of the law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. Imagine that. Imagine that. Keeping the law of God by the power and strength of the Spirit. And we're going to get to that right now. We don't keep the law in our own strength. We, we keep the law by the power of God. We're going to get to that right now. But imagine that. Not lying, not stealing. Nine out of ten, keeping. Nine out of ten. And then at the end of the day, saying, I don't need to keep the Sabbath. The Sabbath was nailed at the cross, which is not true. That one commandment that we refuse to keep because it's uncomfortable for us, because it messes up everything in our life, because I God's law inconveniences my life. When I break one, I break them all. James chapter 2, verse 10. For whosoever shall keep the whole of the law, yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. If we break the Sabbath, we have broken all of them. 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. 1 John 3, 4. Whosoever committeth sin transgresses also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And the truth of the matter is the fourth commandment, the seventh day Sabbath, when we break it, we sin. I'm not going to lighten that. I'm not going to make excuses for it. It's a fact. We need to get our lives right. We need to come into alignment with what God calls holy and just and true. Not in our own strength, because it's not of works, lest any man should boast, but through the power and strength of God. Here we go. This law, this Ten Commandments, and the ceremonial law, both of them. The law is a teacher that teaches us to seek pardon and forgiveness of our sin from Jesus. That's what the law does. Galatians chapter 3, 21. The law teaches us to get pardon and forgiveness of our sin from Jesus. Galatians chapter 3, 21. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could give life, truly righteousness would have been given by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law. Before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto faith, which should afterward be revealed. Wherefore, the law is our schoolmaster. Let's remember this. The law is our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster, for we are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Abraham's seed, and then if ye be Christ, then ye are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Very important that this law is the schoolmaster. The ceremonial law teaches us about Christ, that we need 
forgiveness of this is how you receive forgiveness of sin is through the ceremonial law the lamb of god which taketh away the sin of the world the ceremonial law is our schoolmaster when it teaches us what the messiah would do the ten commandments is our schoolmaster in the sense that it teaches us that we need christ because we have all fallen short of the glory of god all of us we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of god so the, the, the law is a schoolmaster, a teacher, to teach us of our great need of Christ and what the Messiah's role would be. Study the ceremonial system. Study the sanctuary system. And you'll see the most beautiful prophecy of Christ. I can't even describe it. can't even describe it. Uh, Romans 7.12. The law is our school teacher. The, the law teaches us about Christ, all about Christ. Romans 7, 12. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. The law is, it, there's nothing wrong with the law. The law is a good thing, right? It's not the law. It's me. I'm wicked. I'm evil. My nature. It's my fault that I sin. And it goes on to say in verse 13, was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid, but sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might be made exceedingly sinful. It is very important that the law increases the sinfulness of sin by removing all excuses of ignorance. Remember that the, 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 the law is our schoolmaster. It teaches us something. But what happens when your teacher is done teaching you? You've learned. You now move on into maturity, right? That's, that's, the, that's the purpose of being taught, that once you've accumulated this knowledge, you then move on into maturity, right? And it says that the law increases the sinfulness of sin. And that takes place by removing the excuse of ignorance, right? If people don't know that sin is sin, right, that's, that can be the case because not everybody knows what sin is. Some people haven't uh, learned it. And for a time, they can claim ignorance. You know, if you haven't studied the Bible, if you haven't put any um, effort into learning about sin and God, you can claim for a time that you were ignorant on the matter. But ultimately, God is going to reveal it to you. You may reject it, but no one is not given a chance to understand these things, right? And when we learn the law of God, when the Ten Commandments is revealed to us, it shows our sinfulness. It teaches us how exceedingly sinful we actually are, right? We see our great need of a Savior, and we go to Jesus for forgiveness. We go to Jesus for the cleansing of sin. The law shows us where we fall short for genuine love to God and genuine love to others because that's what the Ten Commandments does. It teaches us how to love God and it teaches us how to love others, right? If you love God, you won't worship other gods. You won't take his name in vain. You won't make idols. And if you love God, you'll want to spend time with him on the day he said to. If you love your neighbor, you won't disrespect your parents. You won't kill from them. You won't lie from them. You won't do none of those things that God says not to do. Very important that the law reveals to us how exceedingly sinful we are as it exposes that we don't love God and we don't love our neighbor. Sin is breaking God's law. If there is no law, then there is no sin. That's important because if grace nullifies the law, if grace makes the law non-existent, then there is no law, there is no sin, there is no grace. So if the law is completely wiped out, then there actually is no grace. Right? And the logical conclusion of what popular Christianity teaches is very important. If we take this idea that we are no longer obedient to God because of grace, we take this idea to its logical conclusion. 
which says the law is done away with. The Ten Commandments were nailed to the cross. This logical conclusion must be that sin is now okay. Is, is that the truth? Is sin now okay? Is it no longer a crime against God to break his law? When we take this idea to its fullest conclusion, we can clearly say, no, sin is not okay, and breaking God's law is still a crime to him. Very important. Does the Bible teach that the law has been done away with? No, it does not. The Bible teaches us that obedience is linked to the law. John 14, 15. John 14, 15 says this. If you, this is Jesus speaking now. If you love me, keep my commandments. Love to God is completely um, connected to obedience. Keeping the commandments is obedience. And if we love God, what does Jesus say? If you love me, keep my commandments. This is the exact same wording that was used in the Old Testament. Exodus 25 and 6. Same exact words from the same exact person that gave us the Ten Commandments. Who gave us the Ten Commandments? Christ. Christ gave us the Ten Commandments. And this is what he says in Exodus 25 and 6. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For the Lord thy God am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity upon the the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. It's the same thing in the Old Testament as it is in the New. If you love me, keep my commandments. Jesus taught willful obedience is how we demonstrate our love for God. That's, what, that's literally what Jesus said, both in the New Testament and in the Old Testament, because that was Jesus who was saying that. That was, not, uh, that was not somebody else. Jesus is the creator. Jesus is the one whose fingers wrote on the Ten Commandments, the, the, the law of God. And in the Ten Commandments, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Before his ascension into heaven, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. How can we love Jesus and keep his commandments if they have been nailed to the cross? 1 John chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. Am I saying salvation is, is something that I do? No. No. Salvation is a gift. Even true obedience is a gift, which is given to us by the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, which we're going to see right now. 1 John chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. Says this. 1 John chapter 2, 3 and 4. And hereby we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. That scripture is straight plain. right? He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. 1 John 5, 3. 1 John chapter 5, verse 3. For this is the love of God. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. You want to know why the commandments of God are grievous and a burden to us? Because we don't love God, and that's the truth. Because if you love somebody, you do those things that are pleasing to them. That's a hard thing to say, but it's true. God knows that we don't love him. God knows that. God knows that we don't have the ability to keep his commandments in our own strength. God knows that. And God never asks us to do something that he's not willing to give us the strength to do it. Let's remember that now. That God is not asking me to keep his commandments if he knows I cannot do it. God is saying this. Keep my commandments. If you love me, Keep my commandments. And then on top of that, he says, I will give you the strength to do it. So salvation is a gift, right? By grace, you are saved through faith. It's a gift. Obedience is a gift. The same as salvation. Obedience is not based on what I'm doing. 
Obedience is based on what God is doing. It's the same exact thing as salvation. So when I say salvation is a gift, I don't want to, to get this idea that obedience is something that I do. Why God saves me, I'm obedient to him. No, that's not the case at all. We clearly saw that in uh, the Old Testament when God told the children of Israel, I'm going to make a, a covenant with you. What did the children of Israel say? We will do this in our own strength. And God said, okay, okay, if that's what you want. But what did we see? That not even five minutes after they said that, they, were, they made a golden calf and were worshiping it. We are not obedient in our own strength. God gives us the strength to do it. Galatians chapter 3, 14. Galatians chapter 3, 14, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. The promise of Abraham was that all the nations of the world, uh, all the peoples of the world would be blessed through the seed of Abraham. That seed was Jesus. And that, that, that blessing was that the Spirit of God would come upon the people of the world who accept the Messiah as Lord and Savior, and the Spirit of God would strengthen them to be obedient to uh, the one true God. Titus chapter 3, 5. Titus chapter 3, verse 5 says this. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done. It's not by works of righteousness, which we have done. It's not by works of righteousness, which we have done. But according to his mercy, he saved us. That's grace. His mercy that he used to save us. That's grace. It's the, 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 the obedience factor is the same as the salvation factor. It's the grace of God. Titus 3, 5, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. It's the Holy Spirit that gives us the strength to do what is right in God's eyes. Ezekiel 36, 27. Ezekiel 36, 27. This is what it says. Let's go back to verse 26. Here we go. I'm going to go to 25. Ezekiel 36, 25. Then I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all idols, and I will cleanse you. A new heart will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. It's God's spirit in us who does the work. right? This is the promise of Abraham. This is the washing and the regeneration of the Holy Spirit. That's literally what Ezekiel 25 to 27 says. It says that the Spirit of God is going to wash and cleanse us from our filthiness and cause us to walk in his statutes and his commandments and his laws and his precepts. It's the Spirit of God. It's the mercy of God. It's the grace of God which gives us strength to be obedient. So when I say that salvation is by grace, that's true. We are saved by grace. And when I say that we need to be obedient, I don't want to get this idea that this is something that we do. It's not what we do. It's the Spirit of God in us. But this idea that salvation and disobedience are connected, that is absolutely not true. You cannot violate the law of God and say that you know him. That is a lie, and the truth is not in you. Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians chapter 2, verse 13 says this, For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. How is it that God 
is the one who worketh in me, both to will and to do of his good pleasure by the spirit that he puts in me. He puts in me his spirit, which causes me to walk in his laws, his statutes, and his commandments. In mercy, in grace, that's, that's what God does. In mercy, in grace, God gives me the repentant sinner, everything I need to do which I cannot do in myself. That is obedience. I cannot be obedient in myself. God gives me everything I need through his spirit. That's the mind of Christ. That's the life of Christ. That's the righteousness of Christ in me right now. Not a metaphor, not a symbol, not a typological example, a literal the literal mind of Christ, the literal life of Christ, the literal righteousness of Christ, God gives me through his spirit and I now walk with a new heart because I have been forgiven and I am obedient by the power of the spirit. Very important. And as we think about the sacrifice of Jesus and all that he did to save us, that should do something in my mind, right? My heart should be one to Jesus. That's the truth. As I think about this, the sacrifice of Christ, my heart should be given to him, right? My loyalty should be given to him because Jesus died on the cross for me, right? Jesus gave his life for me. The, Jesus, the Son of God, equal with the Father, gave the life of God for me. Jesus in equal value to the life of God to pay the penalty for the world's sin. The Son of God paid a debt that no one else could pay to save a race of sinners that no one else could save. Jesus, equal with the Father, as deity, as divinity, gave up his life to save us. Jesus paid a debt that no one else could pay to save a race of sinners that no one else could save. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. When Christ gave up his life, he removed from God the Father an accusation of being unjust in forgiving the sinners. That's very important to understand that Jesus removed an accusation from God the Father because Satan said, you cannot forgive a sinner they need to be punished. Jesus said, I will take their punishment and then we can forgive them. Powerful. Powerful, powerful to see that Jesus took the punishment for sin so that we can be forgiven. Powerful. Jesus took the penalty. Jesus became sin. And with his perfect life, he paid in full the wages of sin. That's what Jesus did. Jesus paid in full the wages of sin, satisfying the justice of God, satisfying the penalty of sin. Romans 3, 25 and 26. Romans 3, 25 and 26. Whom God has set forth to be an atonement. Who God has set forth to make right with himself. Through faith in his blood. To declare his righteousness for the forgiveness of sins that are past. Notice that are past. Through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness. That he might be just and the justifier of him that believes. So important to understand that Jesus, divinity, died a death of a sinner so that the, the justice of God could be paid in full. And all who believe in Christ receive a gift. This gift is grace. Through faith, they receive salvation. And that salvation is given to anyone who freely accepts Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Now God can be just as he forgives a sinner because the penalty of sin has been paid in full by Jesus. The wrath of God fell upon Christ. He took it, the mighty conqueror, and now 
he is freely able to be the justifier of all of them who believe. Very, very important. Christ, Jesus, being equal with the Father, says my suffering and death gives me the ability to pay the penalty of sin and justify anybody in the eyes of the Father, right? Salvation to anyone who is willing to accept it by faith. That is grace. Jesus paid it all. There's not a tinge of anything that I can do to add to that. My obedience to Jesus is because what he did. I want to be obedient to Jesus because what he did. Now I need the strength of God to actually be obedient. So in salvation and in obedience, it's God who does the work, not me. I simply submit and receive. Ephesians chapter 2, 8 and 9. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. I'm getting there. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 and 9 says this. For by grace ye are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of worst weeks any man should boast. Can we see the gift now? The gift that Jesus gave us? He paid the price. He took upon himself the penalty of sin. The wages of sin is death. Jesus, divinity, the Son of God, paid a debt that no one else could pay to save a race of sinners who no one else could save. It's beautiful. And to say that obedience to this deity is no longer important is, I would say, blasphemy. I, I will dare to say that is blasphemy, right? God's grace is salvation. This is the gift. It's grace, unmerited, undeserved, not earned. I didn't earn it. I didn't deserve it. I didn't do anything to obtain it. Salvation through Christ our Lord. Grace is salvation. Absolutely. There's no way that we can miss this point. Law is obedience. Absolutely is. Ten Commandments is obedience, not by our power, but by his power. And when I willfully know better and reject the law of God, even in one point, it is if I am rejecting the entire thing. Grace is salvation. Law is obedience. There is a difference, but they are connected. I'll say that again. Grace is salvation. Law is obedience. There is a difference, but they are connected. Two sides of the same coin. Imagine with me. Imagine with me, after the police officer had mercy on me and let me go. Imagine that. The police officer had mercy on me, he let me go, and I rev my engine, right? And I squeal my tires, and I take off speeding down the street again in front of the police officer. That's disrespectful. That's an insult to the mercy that the officer just gave me. Absolutely disrespectful absolutely an insult to the mercy the officer just gave me. Imagine, after I receive the mercy and grace and the forgiveness of breaking the law, I go around thinking the police officer gave me grace. I have the right to go and speed whenever I want. It's not true. It is not true. Imagine, I go around and I tell everybody, we no longer have to keep the speed limit. We can go as fast as we want. Those stop signs, they don't mean anything because the officer forgives. That's, that's wrong. That's disrespectful. That's an insult to the mercy of the one who oversees the law. You can keep, you can keep the speed limit if you want to, but it's no longer a sign of obedience. It's simply a suggestion. That's exactly what the Christian world teaches. A lot, Not all of them, but a large majority who say that the law has been done away with, nailed to the cross. Talking about the Ten Commandment law. Those who say that the Ten Commandments have been done away with and nailed to the cross and we now simply live by grace are going around telling people that I can sin as much as I want. I, I go around telling people that we don't have to keep the law of God anymore. We can sin and we can do whatever we want. That's an insult. 
That's disrespect to the sacrifice of Christ. Right? And what am I, when I do this, what am I doing? I'm lying because that's not true. And I am getting people to believe me. And this idea of it's okay to break the law and to go around doing whatever I want, sinning at my own free will, this is going to cause people to be destroyed. And I am going to be held responsible for that. If I'm going around telling people, you don't have to keep the law no more. It's okay. The one who forgave me is going to forgive you. And we have a free pass to sin. Those people are going to be destroyed. And you are going to be held responsible. This is exactly what people do today. They say that we are in the age of grace, that the law is done away with, and we are no longer accountable to God. But I'm going to say this, that the Old Testament people, they were saved by grace through faith, just like us. I'll say that again. The Old Testament people were saved by grace through faith, just like us. Abraham, Adam, Abel, Noah, Moses, David, they all were saved by grace through faith as they looked forward to the cross. That's an absolute fact. Adam trusted in the blood of the lamb. Abel trusted in the blood of the lamb. Noah trusted in the blood of the lamb. Abraham trusted in the blood of the lamb. Moses trusted in the blood of the lamb. David trusted in the blood of the Lamb as they looked forward to the cross. They were saved by grace through faith in the blood of the Lamb. We are saved by faith through grace as we look back to the cross, as we look back to the blood of the Lamb. And we put our faith in that. We are saved. People of the Old Testament looked forward to the cross as they put their faith in the blood of the Lamb. We look back to the cross, as we put our faith in the blood of the Lamb. It's the same thing. There is no, this is the era of grace and then was the era of the law. There was never a time in human history when it was never faith in the blood of the Lamb isn't what saves. It's always been from the time of Adam and Eve up until now. The, uh, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world, always. That's the biblical record. But when we go around telling people it's okay to break God's law because we're under grace. We are lying and we are leading people to destruction. We are advertising the devil's agenda. That's absolutely what we're doing. Just because Jesus had mercy on me does not mean I get to break his commandments. That's still a sin, still a violation. Will he forgive me? Yes. But let's not harden our heart into thinking that I can live a life of transgression that's, that, that is a shame, very much a shame. We're, we're making the torture and death of Christ something that is insignificant. When we say that I'm saved by grace and that I no longer need to keep the law, we are saying that Jesus' torture and death is insignificant because every time I sin, that is a reason for Christ to be tortured and put to death. Hebrews 6.6. 6. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 6. Hebrews 6.6. 6. If they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to open shame. Is this what we do when we sin? We crucify Christ afresh and put him to open shame. That should cause us to shrink and run from sin. If you got a problem with sin, ask God to give you the spirit to overcome sin. And every time temptation is at your door, think about this. I am about to crucify Christ and put him to open shame. Does the master, Jesus Christ, our Lord, deserve that? Absolutely not. That hurts the Lord. That hurts the Lord. And when we teach others to do the same, it's an insult to Jesus Christ. When we crucify the Lord afresh and put him to open shame, 
that hurts God's heart. It's an insult to teach people to, to, to violate and transgress the law of God. If you go around teaching everybody it's okay to break the Sabbath, you are insulting the Lord. You are crucifying him afresh and you are putting him to open shame. God never asks us to do something that we can't do. If God says, if you love me, keep my commandments, he's going to give us the power to do it. Say that again. God never asks us to do something we cannot do. If God says, if you love me, keep my commandments, he's going to give you the power to do it. Ephesians 3, 16. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16. That he, this is, uh, this is uh, God, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. That is the spirit of God giving us a new heart to do his commandments, to walk in his laws, his statutes, his precepts, his judgments that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with the saints what is the breadth, the length, the depth, and the height and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of God now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we think or ask, according to the power that works in us. That's the Spirit. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout ages, world without end. Amen. Grace is necessary for salvation. That's that gift that God gave us. Jesus paid the debt that no one else could pay. That's grace. Law is necessary for obedience. We are capable of obedience by the indwelling of the Spirit. No doubt. There's, this is not something that I do. I can never do something and go in God's face and say, look what I did, God. If that ever crosses your mind, repent. Salvation is absolutely done by grace. Obedience is absolutely connected to the law by the power of God's Spirit. I'm not under the law. That's absolutely true. I'm not under the law. I'm not condemned by the law because I'm forgiven. That's what that means. The broken law has condemnation. I'm not under that condemnation. That's what that means. I'm not under the law. I am not under condemnation because I've been forgiven. But my forgiveness does not eliminate the law it establishes how important the law is, right? It's so important that the Son of God had to come and die for the violation of the law, right? So let us remember that we have a gift, the grace of God, right? And that gift that Jesus gave us should cause a stir within our heart and mind that this deity, the Son of God, came down and paid a debt that no one else could pay for a race of sinners that no one else could save. And what he went through to save me should put in my heart a heart of loyalty and a desire for obedience. And as I desire obedience, I go to God and say, Lord, fill me with your spirit so that I could walk in the newness, the regeneration, the washing of the Holy Spirit. And God will absolutely do it. But let us not be confused that the Ten Commandments were nailed to the cross. They were not. What was nailed to the cross was the ceremonial law, right? Jesus, being the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world, fulfilled the ceremonial law, so we no longer have to kill lambs and goats and sheep anymore, right? But the Ten Commandments are a perpetual covenant that lasts throughout eternity. They're the foundation of God's uh, government. And the Holy Sabbath day is a day where God wants to specifically spend with us. Let's not tell the one who died for us 
that I'm not interested in spending time with you. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the grace that you have given us, for the undeserved, unmerited, unearned gift. And there's no way that we could ever say thank you enough for what Jesus did for us. But as we see that Jesus paid for um, the wages of sin, we, we, we gladly accept the wonderful gift, the heavenly treasure. Lord, please forgive us of our sins. Put in us uh, your spirit so that we would maybe repent and walk according to your uh, laws, statutes, and judgments. And help us to be obedient to you willfully, gladly. Help us, Heavenly Father. We cannot help ourselves. So, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the precious gift of forgiveness and the precious gift of grace and obedience. And, Lord, as we pray, we ask a special blessing of your Spirit to be with all of us. Keep us, watch over us, continue your work of sealing, and hold back the winds of strife so that we can properly develop the character of Christ in our hearts. We thank you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm. I love y'all.